We're going to talk about spiritual gifts. And there's many, there are many people that are really confused in this area, so I really believe in going back to basics if we can. 1 Corinthians 12 uh, reveals more about the work of the Holy Spirit than does any other passage in this book. And the Greek word pneuma appears 12 times in 8 verses. And so it's, this is really what we're going to be getting into here. A study of the Trinity is what we're going to focus on. That's essential to anyone's understanding of the Holy Spirit. We tend to use that Holy Spirit term so loosely unless we really realize that He is one of the three that make up what we call the Godhead. That's crucial. Let's talk a little bit about plurality. Something you should know, but I'll review it anyway. The word Elohim in Hebrew is a plural. Certain masculine nouns, if they have an I am ending, that means it's a plural, like cherubim, seraphim, and so forth. And so, now the, uh, and even Adonai turns out to be a plural, incidentally. But the, uh, in Genesis 1 1, Elohim bara bereshit. It, Elohim is plural there, but something very strange occurs with that word. It's always used incorrectly, technically. Elohim is a plural noun, and they're supposed to agree with the verb in as many languages. But Elohim is always used erroneously as if it was a singular. Now that should to, uh, clue us into something there, if you will. Um, and uh, the, this is even used by Paul as a grammatical solecism in 1 Thessalonians 3. But moving on. Everywhere that Elohim is written in the Bible... It is a grammatical error. The noun does not agree with the verb. And we're giving here a subtle clue that that more than one, there's more than one within the one, is what it's really telling us, okay? Let's take a couple of examples where it even shows up in the translation. In the Genesis 1, 25, God said, let us, who? Let us, who's he talking to? Let us make man in our image. We're not talking to the angels here. Um, and uh, after our likeness. Again, in chapter 3, he says, The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of what? Us. There again, we, we see this plurality slip through even the translation, if you will, to know good and evil and so forth. And, uh, and, and this can't be associated with angels because they are not associated with the cre- Angels are not cre- associated with the creation. And then uh, uh, chapter 11, Genesis. Go to let us go down. And there, confound their language and so forth. You all know the story and love it. But notice the plurality slip through even the translation. When you get to Isaiah 6 and this fabulous vision of the throne of God, we have the scene in the the holy place of the holy ones, celebrated by the seraphim who veil their uh, faces. And they say, holy, holy, holy. Three, the Lord of hosts. And uh, so there are three declarations there. And so, uh, and we have the same thing occur in Revelation, incidentally. Uh, but uh, in Isaiah 6, 8, we see the hint of the plural. Who shall go for us is the, is the exclamation. And so, so who is the Lord of hosts? All sources acknowledge that it's, it's apl- applicability to the Father, obviously. But it's interesting to notice that John attributes that passage to Jesus Christ in John 12. And Paul attributes to the Holy Spirit in Acts 28. Really? Are these guys mixed up or do they have an insight that we need to pick up on here? All three persons are included in the concept of the Lord of hosts, is the point. Father, certainly. But uh, on John's basis and Paul's basis, we include the other two. Let's talk. This is the thing that I'm really, I think, nails the, the thesis down. The works of God. All the work, I'm going to take you through 14 of them, the works of God. Each one is declared to be wrought entirely and independently by each person of the Godhead. Not any particular one, every one of them. Let me give you an example. The creation of the universe. In Psalm 102, it's attributed to the Father. In Colossians 1 and John 1, it's attributed to the Son. And in Genesis 1 and Job 26, it's attributed to the Holy Spirit. Wow. And we, we think of that in Gen- the second verse in Genesis. The Spirit moved. It's, it attributes the, what's going on there to the Holy Spirit. So it is a, the creation is attributed to the Father in one case, the Son in another case, specifically, and the Spirit in another. Not casually, but very intensively, by the way, if you check those verses. All three, by the way, are gathered into the collective term called Elohim. 
Genesis 1. Let's go to the creation of man. It's attributed to the Father in Genesis 2.7. It's attributed to the Son in Colossians 1.16. And in Job, uh, to, into the Spirit in Job 33. Uh, and the plurals are also uh, summarized in Ecclesiastes and Isaiah. But let's move on. The incarnation itself. And uh, it's attributed to the Father in, in Hebrews 10, to the Son in Philippians 2.7, and to the Spirit in Luke 1.35. It was the Holy Spirit that uh, uh, encountered Mary there. And uh, the Spirit generates the Son, but in such a manner that the Son always addresses the first person as Father. Interestingly enough, we're going to get into that here as we go. And except one time, there's only one time that Jesus did not call him Father when he's on the cross in our place. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's go to the life and ministry of Christ. The Son always did the will of the Father, and to this end the Spirit was given to the Son without measure. We know that. The death of Christ. The Father in Psalm 22, Romans 8, John 3, John 3, 16, right? the death of Christ. The Son it, 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 uh, it takes the credit in John 10, 18, and Galatians 2, 20. The Spirit is attributed to the, uh, uh, it's attributed to the Spirit in uh, Hebrews 9, 14. See, what's interesting, every one of these key events in the Bible is specifically attributed to a different member of the Godhead in some, in some sense or another. The atonement, of course. Father in Isaiah 53, of course. And the Son in Ephesians 5, the Spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. The resurrection of Christ. Who, who, who was responsible for the resurrection? The Father, according to Acts 2, 24 and Romans 6, 4. The Son, according to John 10, 17 and John 2, 19. And uh, the Spirit, 1 Peter 3, 16 and Romans 8, 11. See, there again, it's attributed in, in, in a sense, a specific sense, to each one of them. The resurrection of all mankind. Who is it attributed to? To the Father in John 5, 21, to the Son in the same verse, and then the Spirit in Romans 8, 11. Interesting. The inspiration of the Scriptures. They're God-breathed, right? Well, it's attributed to the Father in 2 Timothy 3, 16, to the Son in 1 Peter 1, and to the Spirit in 2 Peter 1. So Peter had apparently two different opinions. <laughs> First letter, second letter. Okay. The minister's authority. It comes from the Father in 2 Corinthians 3, from the Son in 1 Timothy 1, and from the Holy Spirit in Acts 20. So these, uh, these all in your notes, and I encourage you to chase each one down for yourself, because you will then come out of that experience with a grasp that the Trinity consists of three persons as one that are in total harmony. The indwelling presence. Now this is a, Ephesians 4, 6 is the Father. Colossians 1, 27 is the Son. And the Spirit, of course, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, we covered that a few weeks ago. And the work of sanctification, attributed to the Father by Jude 1, 1, but to the Son by Hebrews 2, and to the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 6. And the uh, believer's safekeeping, John 10, uh, John 10, 28 uh, also, and uh, uh, we have both of those there, if you recall, 28 and 29. And John hammers both the Father and the Son, two hands, remember? And Romans 8, four different ways in Romans 8. And, of course, to the Spirit in Ephesians 4.30. Now, there's all kinds of others, of course. Wisdom in 1 Corinthians 1 and Psalm 8. And there's, we can go on and on with this kind of thing. But let's go another way. What about the attributes of God? Who are they attributed to? All attributes are ascribed to each of the three. Really. The eternal existence is to the Father, Psalm 90. To the Son, Alpha, Omega, first and last, and so forth, in a number of places. And, uh, and to the Spirit in uh, Hebrews 9.14. Infinite power. To the Father, 1 Peter 1. To the Son, in 2 Corinthians 12. The Spirit, Romans 15. Omniscience. The Father in Jeremiah 17. To the Son in Revelation 2.23. And the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 2. Do you see what's going on here? You see, these three are three persons in one. In a very real sense. Omnipresence to the Father, of course, in Jeremiah 23, to the Son in Matthew 18, and the Spirit, Psalm 139. Holiness, obviously, Father, Revelation 15, 4, to the Son in Acts 3, 14, and the Spirit everywhere, we call Him the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Every time His name is, comes up, 
He's attributed to the holiness is included in his name. That's why we have it always in three. Holy, holy, holy in uh, Isaiah 6 and all through Revelation and so on. And truth is attributed to the Father in John 7, to the Son in Revelation 3, 7, and to the Spirit in 1 John 5, 6. And so, and benevolence, of course, in Father in Romans 2, the Son in Ephesians 5, and the Spirit in Nehemiah 9. So the disposition for communion, 1 John 1 to the Father, and 1 John 1, 3 also to the Son, and then 2 Corinthians 13 uh, to, into the Spirit. So uh, uh, Lewis Perry Schaefer summarized this, I think, in excellent terms. I like to quote from him. He says, the fact that each person possesses all the divine characteristics and so completely that it would seem that no other need to possess them speaks of the distinction between the persons as such. On the other hand, the fact that they all manifest these characteristics in identically the same ways and to the same measure speaks of the unity from which their mode of existence springs. Wow. There's another way I like to look at it that maybe this is useful to you. The three persons are equal in nature, but separate in person, but each subservient in duties. How interesting. The Son always does the will of the Father, and the Holy Spirit is obedient that He never speaks of Himself. That's an attribute that needs to be thought through a little bit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit... I think we've established that he's a member of the Trinity. That should not be an ambiguity in your mind at this point. Is a person. He's repeatedly referred to as he, not it, he. And uh, there's one exception where the word pneuma proves to be a neuter word is important in reveling the restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2, but that's an exception. He, yet he never speaks of himself. Jesus warns us about that in John 16, 12. And, and, and because of that, he's always represented by an unnamed servant in typology. It's an unnamed servant that, that uh, uh, Abraham commissions to get a bride for his son in chapter 24. Uh, 24. And uh, it's an unnamed servant that introduces Ruth to Boaz. Whenever the personage in the type represents the Holy Spirit, he's always unnamed. We discover his name by hunting and do a little homework. You discover his name is Eliezer. Which means comforter, interestingly enough. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine, if you're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, you start with the second verse of the book of Genesis. The Holy Spirit brooded on the waters and so forth. He's the source of knowledge, according to 1 Corinthians 2. He has a mind. Romans 8, 27 highlights that. He has a will. He has a will. 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to run into that. He loves us, and by the way, only those who love us can grieve us. Grieve him. We can only grieve those who we love, that loves us. So he, he can be grieved, we discover. He was given a special assignment during the Lord's absence, that's to represent him. He abides with us forever. But is there something more, is the question here, okay. Our relationship with him, there are three prepositions that are used to describe our relationship with the Holy Spirit. Three separate, distinct uh, uh, prepositions. The first one is para, meaning with. The Holy Spirit works with us to convict us of sin and lead us to Jesus Christ. No surprise there, I hope. But there's also in, in, meaning in. Once we've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And that's a different preposition used. But it doesn't stop there. There's a third preposition, epe, upon you. There's a sense in which in, there are certain events occur where he, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And so it's, it's, it sound, it's confusing because he works with us, he dwells in us, but he also comes upon us in some kind of overpowering way occasionally. And so he is living water. He's got a yearning, we discover, Psalm 42 and elsewhere. He is our spiritual source, within our bodies, according to John 7. Jesus says in John 15, without me you can do nothing. So let's just, that's the warm-up. Now let's just jump in to 1 Corinthians 12. First, and this first verse will explain what I've been trying to do here. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 
And some people point out the, those commas are not in the Greek. Some people facetiously say, I would not have you, ignorant brethren. <laughs> but I won't do that here. <laughs> now concerning. See, that these, these are words that are familiar to us now because they respond to issues that were, ra- that were raised in his earlier letter, the letter that caused him to write this one. And marriage, virgins, food offered to idols, we've gone through all of those up till now. He uses the term brothers because whenever, he en- whenever Paul enters a sensitive area, he tends to remind uh, the, his readers that we're brothers, the brothers in Christ. He's writing, to, he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to unbelievers here. And, uh, and he's talking about spiritual gifts. Pneumatikon, the gifts of this Holy Spirit. That's synonymous with charisma, gift of grace. And in this chapter, the word charisma is going to point to activities of specifically the Holy Spirit. I don't want you, do, not, do not want you to be ignorant. He does that often. In all his key passages, and there's a handful of them in your notes there, I do not want you to be ignorant. He's trying to repair that ignorance. Ignorance of what? What is he not, doesn't want him to be ignorant of? The spiritual gifts. That's what he's going to focus on in this chapter. Paul will spend three chapters on this subject, in effect, on how to evaluate and use spiritual gifts. And they're, they're to be used to the benefit of fellow believers, not as badges of superiority. In fact, of the three, the middle chapter is the most important one. These chapters are given to unite, not divide the body. And yet it's amazing that this subject probably has caused more division in the body than, than certainly more than it would please the Lord. That's, I'm sure, very disturbing. There are two common errors that you want to avoid. Two common errors regarding spiritual gifts. The first is ignoring them. There are many churches that try their best to ignore them. And there's others that overemphasize one gift over another. We find rampant both extremes everywhere. People who won't have anything to do with them, don't want to talk about them, they sweep them under the carpet if they can. In the other case, they, those that make it a major career, then unless you're speaking in tongues, you're not really saved kind of attitudes. We're gonna, he's going to deal with both of these. The abuses are going to be dealt primarily in chapter 14. We're in chapter 12. When we get to chapter 13, he's going to show us a better way altogether. But let's get back to the We made it down to the second verse. We're doing pretty good here. <laughs> Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols even as ye were led. They were mute idols in effect. They were voiceless and they had nothing to say as Paul puts it. Okay. And the Greek word led here, as, as ye were led, is imperfect meaning it was continuous. It was repeated. See, it's in, it's in the imperfect tense. Uh, you're, continue, be, you're continuing being led in that area. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. And uh, there's some people suggest that Paul is opposing the Gnostic teachers who taught a dualism of material and spiritual. However, the Holy Spirit is the issue which occurs twice. One uh, blaspheming Jesus will not be uttering a curse through God's Spirit, is what he's saying. A person, a Jew or Gentile, confessing the Lord Jesus does so by the Holy Spirit. And uh, Paul may be recalling his own past history here. Because he was the one that forced so many people to blaspheme before his conversion. He's stressing the absence or presence of the Holy Spirit on how people speak of Jesus. You could paraphrase this legitimately by saying, no man speaking by the Spirit of God is indifferent to the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're speaking by the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be it won't be casual. It won't be indifferent. The confession that Jesus is Lord is one of the oldest creeds in Christendom, by the way. And uh, kurios is a very tremendous word. It was the official title of the Roman emperor. Lord. On the day of Pentecost, the Jewish converts received Jesus as both Lord and Christ. Is the, is the emphasis there in Acts 2. Converted Gentiles forsook their pagan past and pledged allegiance to Jesus as both Lord and Savior in Acts 16 and Romans 10. 
Christians received Jesus as ruler of the world, as king of the kings and lord of lords. That was the concept. That's what offended the Romans so much because he was a competitor so in their mind. Now some people will call Jesus Lord and even perform valuable tasks in his service. But if they are not filled with God's Spirit and therefore fail to do the Father's will, Jesus will dismiss them by saying, I never knew you. What a terrifying term. That's the reason William Welling and I wrote the book, I, Jesus, an Autobiography. It was our way of trying to correct a mistaken identity. Many people don't really understand who Jesus is, and that's why we use that rather unusual approach. Jesus exercises his sovereign will in this world. He recognizes only those people who, led by the Holy Spirit, acknowledge his true identity and obediently bow to his authority. I hope that doesn't characterize anyone here. Now there are diversities of gifts. Now we're going to get into the diversity. We're down to four, four, verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Diversities of gift. We're going to see there's three pairings. Gifts, administrations, and operations. The Spirit, Lord, and God. The Trinity is at work here. Every believer has some gift or gifts, but never all of them. Unity is not uniformity in its parts. Unity is not uniformity in its parts. Paul lists nine charismata in this chapter. Wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, faith, healings, miracles, spiritual discernment, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. I don't believe there's just nine. These are representative, I believe. Although people will talk of the nine, and here they are. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are at least 21 of these in the New Testament. Some would count administration apostleship from this chapter along with serving, teaching, encouraging, contributing, leadership, showing mercy, celibacy, evangelism, pastoring, and public service. The references there, some people would add that to the list. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. I do not, I personally, this is just a personal opinion, I do not believe that any of the lists are intended to be complete. I, I believe they're representative. And uh, I don't think there's anything uh, secure about the, the length, the details of those lists per se. No one should boast of having received a greater gift. No servant is greater than his master. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. God's kingdom is without borders. There's no distinction between sacred and secular. That's a term we use voca in vocabulary, but it's doesn't, that doesn't work in the, before the throne room. God wants his people to minister to a hurting world that needs help physically, emotionally, spiritually, and materially. Nor is there a limitation of only one gift. Paul had received the gift of continence and speaking in tongues according to um, chapter 7 and 14 here in, this, in, in 1 Corinthians. The gift is for the common good of the entire community and the edification of the body. That, sum, that's, that summarizes the whole thing that's coming here. And Paul's going to deal with the abuses of all this in chapter 14. Not the next one, but the one after that. For to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit. See, to another, diverse gifts. This is just a representative list. Wisdom is listed first here, and we're going to discover tongues are listed last. They're going to be the, the least of, the one, of them. Spiritual gifts. One is wisdom. Divine wisdom. And con contrasted with human wisdom. As we open this whole letter on that subject. And one of the seven spirits uh, 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 of, of uh, wisdom were in uh, Isaiah. The, list, the famous list of seven spirits in uh, Isaiah 11. They were fulfilled in Christ according to Luke 2. They were given to Stephen in Acts 6. And, and here's Stephen, this young deacon, who gives a history lesson to the Sanhedrin himself. And it's available to all of us, according to James 1. So that one's pretty straightforward. Knowledge, is a, the word gnosis is a little different. It depends not on intellect, but on love, strangely enough. On intimate, personal relationship. Both of these were discussed earlier when we were in chapter 2. And they contrast, and, con and what you should do is compare, contrast, Peter's rhetorical performance 
prior to Pentecost. Remember Peter all, during the, all through the Gospels? Always, the only time he opened his mouth was to change feet. He was always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time with a couple of exceptions. And you contrast that with his two sermons in the early chapters in chapters 2 and 3 of Acts. They're eloquent, well-organized. It's astonishing to compare his rhetorical ability prior to Acts 2 with what happens after Acts 2. You, you could just see the transformation. It's amazing. Moving on to verse 9. And to another, faith by the same Spirit. And to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. So faith is a gift. Not saving faith, but an unshakable trust that God will perform miracles. Peter and John, in opposing the Sanhedrin, preaching the gospel, healing the cripple. There's all examples. Paul's call to Rome is an example. His behavior during the storm on the Mediterranean Sea. And on it goes. And, and uh, James reminds us that even Elijah was a man like us. And then the gift of healing. That's another gift widely misunderstood. It's not a permanent gift. But it's a sovereign manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Even Paul's own uh, thorn in the flesh went unhealed. He desperately wanted that healing and couldn't get it. Prayed for it three times. And he indirectly admits that he lacked the ability to heal either Epaphroditus, Timothy, or Trophimus. These are three of his friends that were ill that he could not heal. So we sh but we should not cease asking, we were told in Hebrews 4 and James 5. So the healing uh, is not a gift in the sense that it is a permanent gift. It's an event that occurs under the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit. But it continues here in verse 10. And to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of the tongues. Notice that the tongues and the interpretation are separate gifts. Miracles is the first one listed here. More miracles took place during Jesus' ministry than at any other time in biblical history. It wasn't limited to that, but that's dominant. The supreme one being in the resurrection, which will be the subject of chapter 15. When we get to chapter 15, we're going to, it's a chapter that Paul suggests is the most important chapter in the Bible. So we're probably going to spend more than one session on chapter 15 when we get there. Miracles were the distinctive mark of an apostle, according to 2 Corinthians 12, and they were used to confirm the message of the gospel. And then we had to another, the gift of prophecy. Forthtelling. Prophecy is not predicting. It's telling forth God's plan. And it was a key element in, in Corinth as seen in chapter 11, the previous chapter. Sometimes prophecy does include predictions like Agabus in Acts 11 and 21. Or it's to interpret God's will to the church. But prophecy is not given to predict. That's called divination that's prohibited in the Torah. Prophecy is given to glorify God when it does happen. There's a difference there that's very important to understand. And prophetic utterances are always to be judged by Scripture. That's your yardstick. They will never be inconsistent with the Scripture. And God's Word is always the standard. As you know, that's been our, that, Acts 17.11 has been our a motto as such for, what, five decades, I guess. And the discerning of spirits. Ah, here's the challenge. Satan, often as an angel of light, communicates false information and deceit as he did with Eve right there in the garden. That's worth studying and understanding. Creating doubt and then denial. The prophet Micah revealed to the kings of Israel and Judah that a lying spirit spoke through the mouths of all the prophets of Israel at one time. Wow. No security there, is there? Jesus discerned the voice of Satan and Peter, if you recall, Matthew 16. Paul recognized Bar-Jesus as the son of the devil, and, he all, and also the fortune-telling of the slave girl that she lost that gift when she was saved. John instructed us to test the spirits, 1 John 4. And in the end times, be ready for this one, in the end times, Satan and his cohorts will work miracles. We're not ready for that. We're not ready for that. Can you imagine a, a political leader that has the ability to raise people from the dead? Apparently. Wow. 
And there will be false teachers also. That's, those warnings are all through the Scripture. We have to hammer that one here. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse, diverse kinds of tongues. Now that's the one that we want to take a closer look at. And the way you protect yourself from counterfeits is by carefully studying the genuine. Tongues. Speaking in unknown tongues is often accompanied with the epi relationship, the coming upon. The exercise of this gift also generates so many problems that an entire chapter will be devoted to them. Chapter 14 is going to deal with the, the, the problems that this created. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, not everybody's going to have the same gift as he wills. No one received all the gifts and no one is without a gift. That's interesting. That's one of your challenges. If you discover your spiritual gift, you know what he, God's calling you to do. It's a way of finding out your calling. The Spirit neglects no one and all is the result of his divine prerogative. We each can have all of the graces, but we cannot have all of the gifts. And so that's Important to understand. That's the mistake is when somebody starts putting one gift over another. I'll tell you some interesting stories about that when we get to chapter 14. And throughout this passage, Paul speaks in the present passive indicative, is being given, uh, to convey that God continues to give these special gifts to his people. They weren't just for a peculiar period back then. Therefore today, that's what this is saying. Dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. One spirit. See, now having looked at the trees, Paul now is going to turn to the forest, if you will. Jesus taught that he and his people are one. Matthew 10, 25, Max 9, and so on. That's all in your notes. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Baptized into one body. Jesus baptizes His followers with the Holy Spirit. Many people try to make that into a special sacrament of some kind. Paul says all of us were baptized. He's using that in the metaphorical sense. James and John were challenged whether they were able to be baptized as he was. Jesus challenged them. Can you? He uses that term in a different metaphorical sense. In Mark 10, Luke 12, and Acts 1. These words extend to a circle enclosing all believers. All believers are baptized into one body. That's the way he is using that vocabulary. Some people use the word uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit in a specialized, denotative sense. That's not the way Paul is using it here. We're all baptized into one body. Includes all of us. And into one body. Paul is stressing the unity of the church in its diverse forms. Now, some people view this text as referring to the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Greek verb tense calls for a single occurrence of drinking, which is incongruent with the repeated observance of the Lord's Supper. They're not the same. The sacraments are not Paul's focus here, but the internal transformation by the Holy Spirit bringing people into a living relationship with Christ is, is his burden here. So let's not make something out of nothing here. And all have been made to drink unto this one Spirit. This term seems to rule out any interpretation which requires a later right for the impartation of the Spirit. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit can't act in some interesting ways, but this doesn't require a later right, if you will, for the impartation. We've all been made to drink into one Spirit. The Greek verb potizo, I give to drink, or I irrigate, or as in living water, is yielding the harvest of the fruit of the Spirit, basically. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, 
I am not of the body. Is it that we're not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Don't tell me that Paul can't use, you know, be facetious at times, huh? For the body is not one member, but many, many. For the body is not, but uh, varied, but coordinated parts, in other words. The intention here is to eradicate all envy with respect to a particular spiritual gift that a member might not have received. How interesting it is, how, how, how frequent it is that we find tension or envies between the gifts as if they did something to, to warrant them. No, they're gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're gifts. If the whole body were an eye, where <laughs> were the hearing? If the, whole, if the whole were hearing, where are the smelling? You get the, it's hard to tell where he's reasoning or we're just being facetious here. Paul is stressing our mutual dependence and on one, and one another as, and the absurdity of nurturing jealousy because of spiritual gifts. I need you to have your gift. You need me to have mine. That's the point. And when you phrase it that way, I think it becomes clearer. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. God is the subject of this verse. Gifts are given in accordance with his design. Important structure there. Bezalel, Aholiab, and other craftsmen were building the tabernacle. In Exodus 31, you see, there were people with spiritual gifts of craftsmanship that made the furniture for the tabernacle. Those were spiritual gifts. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Compare the discovery of disciplinary groups for operation. You know, one of the things, one of the great discoveries that was made during World War II, out of necessity, they assembled study teams that ended up including a, a diverse, uh, diverse talents. A uh, engineer, a mathematician, a behavioral scientist, an economist. They were very t- they were four or five different, they, because they just were forced to. That's all they had. But they made a discovery that these groups of interdisciplinary teams came up with ideas that none of them would have come up by themselves. They discovered a phenomenon that has been since much written about, the power of the interdisciplinary groups. It led to a form of uh, uh, management professionalism called operations research. But in military strategies, they, they typically will go out of their way now to create an interdisciplinary team realizing that people have different patterns of thought and, and uh, that can be fruitful, very fruitful. And so that, uh, there's now a whole body of literature in the management sciences, in fact that's what it's called, the management sciences, uh, uh, built around this, the idea of having diversity of gifting within the, within the group. But now are they many members yet but one body? And another example of this, by the way, is musical harmony. What would an orchestra sound like if all the instruments were the same? That's just a clumsy example, but I think it dramatizes what he's trying to say here. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I, uh, and by the way, I'm, I, I think I'm running ahead of time. I can, I can sneak in another comp- uh, I'm always nervous about ad-libbing a little bit because it'll th- screw up the timing, but there is something else that I think can be pointed out here. Um, when an egg is fertilized, it goes through mitosis. It, it splits into, one, the, the single cell splits into two, identical ones. The two split into four. You all have seen the movies or uh, 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 how that goes on. And as that goes on, it fi- they finally start to not be identical. They start becoming specialized into certain kinds of tissue. And those tissues start to become organs. And, and, and we, we see the incredible miracle of, uh, a, of new life. What's interesting, if you study that from an information science point of view, you get confronted with a paradox. Because your first 
presumption is that everything they would needed to know was in that first cell. Because that first cell that's splitting and splitting and out of that comes a very complex thing. It turns out from an information science point of view, you can quickly come to the realization that the information is not in that first cell. And to, to dramatize what I mean by this, imagine every one of you could play every instrument in the, in the uh, orchestra. And let's assume I gave you a copy somehow of the entire symphony. Everyone had the same one. Would you have a symphony? Of course not. Because there's something missing. In, in computer science terms, it's called conflict resolution logic. Somebody has to say, you're going to be first violin, your percussion, what, and it, someone has to organize that. It turns out that to the extent you have a background in information sciences, you suddenly discover that God has to be involved in every cell division. There's input from the outside to make it happen. It can't be self-contained. That's a contradiction in information science terms. And so, that's staggering, by the way, that when you have a child, you're creating an eternal being. You aren't, he is. But uh, every, every cell division has got involved. Anyway, let's move on. The eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. The absurdity of independence. Self-sufficiency flies in the face of servanthood. And that's, that's as it should be. Nay, much more than those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Jesus himself told Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made complete or perfect in weakness. Verse 23, And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Our unrespectable parts are treated with even more respect. I'm not going to touch that one with a ten foot pole. Let's move on. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that which lacked. That there should be no schism or division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Unity is the principal purpose. No one should ever be neglected within the church. Love thy neighbors thyself is out of Leviticus 19.18, and so on. Any gift which does not provoke love, tolerance, and forbearance toward other believers is not a gift from the Lord. Love is the final and acid test. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. An organism, not a society... A communion, not a guild. A fellowship, a koinia, not an association. Now, are, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Ye are the body of Christ. See, despite their quarrels, their divisions, their failure to expel an immoral brother, bringing lawsuits against, these are all things we've been talking about, bringing uh, lawsuits against fellow brothers, criticizing apostles, not properly observing the Lord's Supper. These whole list of things that, are, that are, have been burdening Paul. No, he wants one entity without division. Christ loves his church. To injure or insult it is to injure or insult him. You can't join it. You must be born into it. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, Thirdly, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversity of tongues. By the way, apostles, there were apostles more than just the twelve. Paul and Barnabas being examples. They were accorded the authority of Old Testament prophets. The church has predictive prophets like Agabus, Barnabas, Simon, Nagar, and uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Manane in Antioch, in Caesarea, the four daughters of Philip, in Jerusalem, Judas and Silas, they were, they were uh, prophets. Yes, there were women prophets, poor daughters of Philip. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, he warns us. He continues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, 
Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? That's an interesting question. Do all speak with tongues? Apparently not. Do all interpret? Paul asks seven rhetorical questions here. No one gift is universal. How strange it is that gifts were to facilitate the unity of the church, and yet some insist that a single gift is essential, and thus they divide the body. Others deny the validity of the gifts, and they too divide the body. Get it, get, getting it hit both ways. But covet earnestly the best gifts. And then he gives us this beautiful promise. Yet I show unto you a more excellent way. He's saying desire the greater gifts, the higher gifts. And chapter 14 is going to relegate tongues to the last on the list. You're going to discover of all the list. Tongues are the lowest on the list. And it extols prophesying forth telling the gospel higher. But the, rather than either of that, the, yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And uh, that's his introduction to next week's study. Chapter 13. Love is not a spiritual gift, but it's rather a complete way of life. And Galatians 5 develops that. So one of the questions that will lurk from this session, are the spiritual gifts for today? And uh, see, the Holy Spirit has an attribute of God. He's immutable. That means he changes not. Okay? Where does it say that these gifts are to terminate? It doesn't. In fact, it says the opposite. Because when you remember what Peter declared in Acts chapter 2 at the Pentecost, um, this is what Peter declares there in Acts. He says, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days that God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy, and your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, they shall prophesy. And it goes on like this. Notice, though, that Peter is declaring in Acts chapter 2 what they're experiencing with the tongues there is that which was spoken of by Joel. So what has started in Acts was sp spoken of by Joel. But Joel describes that as something that will go all the way to the last days. So Joel tells you that they will not terminate until, until, until the very end. And that's in Acts 2. He declares it. So if the gifts are not, what about teaching? What about these other gifts? Are they going to terminate? No. The only one they apply, there are certain seminaries that teach that the, 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 that the uh, gifts are, that the gifts of tongues are not for today, and they do that on a strange basis. They say that the, the gifts are only until the close of the canon is one of the arbitrary things that they have embraced. And that's, that's in contrast to what Jesus said in the upper room, by the way. But even more, but what I love to do with them is talk about the uh, Revelation 10. See, they use the, the passage in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will done away. And they say that that's the close of the canon, and therefore the gifts are not after the close of the canon, I say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. In Revelation 10, we have seven thunders that John was about to write, and it wasn't let, he said, see, I do it not. So can the canon be complete? It can't be complete until those seven thunders are written. And, they, and when I first did that, they thought I was being facetious. No, I was being quite serious. Technically, the canon can't be complete until those th thunders are uttered. So trying to build a doctrine on the canon being complete is obviously error. And the whole idea that, oh, the, the gifts are for today is the point. So for your next session, though, I've got a very unusual assignment for you. Because uh, Paul has just closed this session by saying, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. So what you need to do for the next session is to memorize 1 Corinthians 13. Not study it, not read it. No, no, no. You memorize it. It is going to be one of the most precious documents in your life. Just a few verses called 1 Corinthians 13. Memorize it. And we'll try, to, we'll try in our feeble efforts to do it justice when we meet again.